Hi folks, welcome back. We're continuing our journey through genus Homo until we're ultimately going to end up on us. But we're, we, we talk about early genus Homo. That was Homo habilis. They were the very first. The big important part about them is they're the first ones who entered genus Homo. They also set down some standards. Uh, the first of which is they decided early on that their brains, our brains, to be in genus Homo, you had a minimum brain size. Your, your brain had to be a minimum of 650 cc's or larger. That's 650 cubic centimeters or larger. The problem with that is it doesn't seem to carry through, and we'll see how that works later on. But first, I want to introduce Homo erectus. Homo erectus is really the one that made us the way we are today. If you imagine all of the other things that we've looked at and all of the previous uh, hominins that we've looked at, we've been talking about their physical appearance, their physical abilities. But now we can start to delve into what they were doing and that will bring up a lot of questions about why they were doing it, which is really interesting. So let's start by looking at the skull you're staring at, Homo erectus. He looks like the world's first pimp, right? He's got gold teeth. Well, the truth is his teeth aren't really gold. I don't know why, but it's just the way the picture came out. But in fact, these teeth down here that look kind of this gold hue in this picture would actually be more this color of the rest of the fossil. They just have kind of a weird tint to them in this picture. I don't know why. Anyway, he's not the world's first pimp. But he is the world's first at a lot of things. And we're going to talk about those things. Number one, his brain is pretty big. Remember, Homo habilis was amazing because their brains were 650 cc's, which is very large. Homo erectus's brain is about 1,000 cc's. That's about half again large, almost, a little less, half again the size of Homo habilis's brain. So again, we've had this giant leap in brain size. And the reason that that happened is literally the reason that we have such big brains today. These guys started using a lot of new, new technologies that changed everything. We'll talk all about that. But the other thing that I want to talk about that makes Homo erectus very, very unique. First of all, if we were to show you, if I showed you this image of this skull way back when we had started this class, you'd probably think, well, that's a human skull. Well, you wouldn't be wrong. It is technically human, but it's not anatomically modern human. It's not like us. We've got a larger brain still. And I'll talk about why that's so important later on. But Homo erectus made up one other very, very important progressive leap. Remember, Homo habilis, Australopithecines, Sahelanthropus, where did we find all of them? What continent? We found them on Africa. Africa is a big continent. It can, it can hold a lot of individuals. But this one's name is Peking Man. Do you want to explain to me where in Africa is Peking? I'll give you a minute. No, I won't. Peking's not in Africa. Peking's the old name for Beijing. It is in China. What the hell is he doing in China? Does that mean that Homo erectus started all over again in China? No. They actually were also in Africa, also in Europe, also in Asia, also in parts of Indonesia. They're all over the place. These guys probably made it all over the world. That is an astonishing feat, but it brings up a lot of other questions, like why? We'll talk about all of these things in the next few slides. The very first thing I want to bring your attention to, and I, and I apologize, I'm using this old phylogeny, but it really is excellent to illustrate this idea, and I love it for this. So I'm going to ask you to concentrate over here. We're looking at this and this line. Couple of things. Number one, with the exclusion of this orange line over here, which is actually two different species. 
This is how Artipithecus ramidus and Artipithecus cadaba. They should be split here, but don't worry about that. Aside from the orange line, if we were to bring this blue line in with this line, look at how long that line is. Homo erectus, by the way, Homo ergaster, not even a legitimate name. Homo ergaster, which was on the previous slide, is a name that was invented by a guy who really had no place inventing names. The rule goes, if you want to name a new species, you have to have it published in a peer-reviewed journal. The peer-reviewed journal that Mazak got Homo ergaster published in was a mining journal from Czechoslovakia. Check mining journal. What does that have to do with anthropology? The answer is nothing. And was it really peer reviewed then? No. Is it a legit name? No. The reason they decided to split Homo erectus and Homo ergaster is that Homo ergaster is supposed to be, quote, the older or the classic or the one that shows up in Africa. Truth is, none of that stands when you have a single species that's found all over the world. So it doesn't make any sense. Plus, it's not really older. They thought it was, but when we see Demonisi, it kind of ruins all that. So I drop, in fact, almost all paleoanthropologists will drop this Homo ergaster idea and squish him in with Homo erectus. And if we do that, look at how long the Homo erectus line becomes. These are the most successful species of hominins that has ever lived. I'll repeat that. They're the most successful species of hominins that have ever lived. That includes you and I. Remember, we base success on how long the species was on the planet, how much they've had to adapt to. Well, guys, remember, we've only been around about 300,000 years. Look at this little blip here compared to that. Okay, let's compare our heads a minute. On your left, we have a modern Homo sapiens. This is what we would call anatomically modern human, or AMH, Homo sapiens sapiens, technically. On the right, we have a typical Homo erectus, or a Homo erectine skull. First thing I, you'll probably notice is they have a long, low cranium. Even though their brain size is much larger than what we've seen previously, they're still smaller than ours. They've got about 1,000 cc's. We've got about 1,360 on average, 1,340 to 1,360. So they have this long, low, football-shaped cranium. Ours is sort of more globular. It's more round and higher. But look at down here in the face especially this area. First of all, you're going to notice our teeth have actually receded. Their teeth stick way out in front. They have larger teeth. They're bigger than ours still. Remember, our teeth continue to get smaller. Our brains continue to get bigger. But there's one interesting side effect of our teeth getting so tiny is that we have this protruding chin. You see how our chin sticks out? If this guy, take the nose away, if this guy ran face first into a door, first thing that's going to hit is his chin. This guy, the first thing that's going to hit is teeth. So our chin is only left over. Our chin is actually in the same place their chin is. The difference is our teeth have receded back. Their teeth remain forward. So we're the only ones with a chin, and that'll come up later when we talk about Homo floresiensis. Where do we find Homo erectus? This is where it gets really exciting. Do we find them in East Africa? Yes, of course. They're all over the place. Bodo Buri, Olegazili, Olduvai, Ilaret, Turkana. They're actually found all over in Africa. But look at this. They're found in Eastern Europe. They're found in Central and Western Europe. They're found way over here in Java, up here in Jacodien. This is way the hell up in China. What is going on? In fact, we have later found stuff down here in Australia. And look at this, Box Grove, England. 
Foxgrove, England. Think about this for just a minute. Is it cold, wet, and rainy in England today? You bet. Was it then? Yes. In fact, it was probably a lot colder back then because they were still in the beginnings of an ice age. What the hell's going on? Here we've got a long, lean, Allen's Rule adapted body living up in cold, wet Foxgrove, England. What allowed them to do that? How did they do it? It's all about technology. We'll talk a lot more about that. This is another idea of where they went. They seriously spread everywhere. They probably started down in really this whole area of Africa. We know they moved up and out and walked around the planet. Now, what are they doing? Are they inventing boats? Honestly, we don't know. More than likely, they're walking across land bridges here and there. All of these areas were at one time or another kind of connected by land with the exception of the Australian continent. But they may have been able to make that as well with a short journey. But now I want you to think of something that we haven't done yet in any of these classes. Think of why. Why are they going to these new places? What gives? Think about what humans do. I always get a lot of answers for that. When I ask my face-to-face -face classes, why are these people going to those places? Oh, well, did they run out of food? No. Africa is a huge continent. They have tons of food. They didn't run out of food. They didn't overpopulate Africa. No, we still haven't po overpopulated Africa. Even modern humans, and there are a lot more of us than there were of them. What's going on? Why are we on the moon? Why are we in space? Why do we want to go to Mars? Have we run out of room on, the, on this planet? Some people would say yes, but truth is no. Did we run out of supplies? Are we all starving to death? No. Are we out of oxygen, out of anything else? No. Why are we going? Why did we go to the moon? Did we do anything when we got to the moon? No. Curiosity. The one thing that humans all share is our rampant curiosity, the need to know. And all of these areas, all of the Indonesian islands, if I, I'm going to point out Indonesian islands right down here, you can literally see each one from the next. So they end up down here on Java. How come? Because they went, hey, what's over there? And then they communicated enough using whatever to say, want to go with me over there? <laughs> They've got to convince their friends to go with, to colonize these areas. Now, let me tell you, this didn't happen in a single lifetime. Remember, these guys were around for over a million years. They were moving little by little. Two guys living here along the side of Lake Turkana are like, well, you know, I don't like them, so let's move our family over here. Next family moves. Next family, next family, next family, next family, next family. Thousands of families moving just a little bit further to get away from mom and dad, to get out of the basement, go, go to college. Just kidding. Of course, they weren't going to college. In fact, they didn't have bas basements, more than likely, unless you want to include all caves or technically basements, but there you go. So what's going on? They're curious. Is that because of this new big giant brain? Here's the Nariakotomi boy. Don't worry, I won't make you pronounce it. The Nariakotomi boy, also known as Turkana boy, because he was found right along where the Nariakotomi River opens up into Lake Turkana. But this is the thing. Remember, all the rest were three feet, four feet tall. This guy. And I should say this kid, because he probably wasn't full grown yet, was about five foot ten. Let that sink in. These are modern height people. And really, I showed you the differences in their skull, other than the fact that they have a really wide nose, too. We didn't talk about that. And a bigger brow ridge and things like that. But from their neck down, they're literally exactly like us. They are the first obligate biped. We haven't talked about that yet. We met habitual bipeds when we were talking about 
Australopithecus. But now, these guys are always walking around. They're built just like we are. We're built to walk and jog. We are not really built to climb. We can do it, but we're not great at it. They've got a big brain, around about 1,000 cc's. Their teeth, while still bigger than ours, are starting to look a lot smaller. They're starting to look more like modern humans. To give you an idea of the size differences that we're talking about here, here we've got Lucy on the right and Narikotomi boy on the left. Lucy came up to about his waist. She's tiny, but even her big boyfriend, or even Homo habilis, 1470, the big guy, still would come up to maybe his shoulder, tops. This guy towers over everybody else. And he's only 5'10", he's still growing. Homo erectus living all over the world, we would expect to see different shapes, different sizes, different builds. They're adapting to their environment. This is Bodo, he's a big, burly man. Here's Jacodia, she's a tiny, dainty little lady. This guy's part way in between, but what are they doing? This is where it gets really exciting. Other than moving all over the place, you guys, they're doing this to bone. This gets really exciting. They're crunching into bone using stone tools. Why? What's inside bone? Do you guys remember that bone marrow we talked about? way back when we were talking about the bones themselves, how bones create blood cells. Well, all that happens in these, this fleshy stuff in the middle of bones called bone marrow. Bone marrow is extremely calorie and nutrient dense. It's actually better for you in a survival situation than meat. Bone marrow is like nature's power bar. This stuff has fat, calories, protein. It's got it all vitamin. These guys are getting into that. They're probably not killing the animals. This is something important. And we'll talk about the distinction between, and actually the genius, between being a scavenger and being a hunter. Really scavenging is a better way to go because you don't have to do the dangerous work. We'll see how that works out in a little bit. The tools that they're using to do these. This is called the Acheulean Hand Axe. You can see it written up here in, in red. The Acheulean Hand Axe. And one of the sites where we find a huge group of them is Olergazaya. What's so exciting about Olergazaya? This is a, a site in East Africa. Look at the ground of what we're looking at. Not the fence, not the walkway, that's for tourists. What are tourists going to see? It is all of these rocks. Do you guys see all these rocks down here? All these stone implements? Look at how many of them there are. This is what's so exciting about Olegazile. Olegazile looks like a manufacturing site. And they're not manufacturing these stone tools out of just any rock they find. Nope. They're actually traveling to another area about five kilometers away. That's about two and a half miles each direction. Picking up the raw material to make this with, which is volcanic glass. This is your flint, your obsidian. Volcanic glass can get extremely sharp. I alluded to it before. In the previous talk, I talked about you can actually shave with broken rocks if it's the right rock. These rocks are made out of volcanic glass. This stuff, when you break it in just the right way, when you're flint napping, you can actually flake off a piece. And what happens to that edge? The edge goes to such a fine point. Let me explain this to you for a second. Razor blades. They're considered sharp. The reason they're so sharp is because they're so thin. What are razor blades made out of? Steel. You guys all know that. Well, steel is capable of getting down to three microns thick. That's narrower than a human hair. It's pretty thin. That'll cut pretty much anything. Something three microns thick is super thin. But volcanic glass can cleave down to one 
micron thick. That is, it's three times sharper than a razor blade. Ready for your minds to get blown? They used to up until the 1980s. In fact, the mid-80s, they would do cataract surgery. That is the surgery on your eyeball to get rid of that uh, clouded lens within your eye. They would do that with obsidian knife blades, believe it or not. Those were sharper. They would cause less damage to the eye. They didn't change from that until we started with the laser technology that they use today. This is what all of those Acheulean hand axes look like up close. And the exciting thing about Oler Ghazali is there's so many of them, and most of them are rejects. All of this stuff laying on the ground are things that they were like, mm, nah, not good enough. Let that sink in. It's almost like a, a manufacturing plant or a school or something like that where they're teaching others to make them. We don't know why there's such a concentration of these hand axes. But I want to draw your attention to the shape. If we look up here, do you see this teardrop shape? Well, around the edges on a finished one, these are all razor sharp. And you can do a lot with that. The Acheulean hand axe is associated with everywhere that we find these guys. That is, from all the way from Africa to Foxgrove, England, and down into Australia. We found these things, and they're all associated with Homo erectus, meaning these guys brought their material, their tools, and their culture all around the entire world, the whole known world at the time. None of them made it over to the New World, the Americas, yet. That happened much, much, much later. This is crazy stuff. These guys literally changed the face of the planet, and they really are us. So now let's put everything together. Are they doing the hunting? No. Has anybody in this entire course ever taken down a horse with your bare hands? The answer is hell no. What about a stick or a stone? Hell no, hell no. Who's the best hunter in Africa? A lion. And what do big cats do after they eat? What do your house cats do after they eat? They go over, lay down, go to sleep. Are they dangerous? after they've eaten and they're sleeping, they don't give a damn what these weird little hairy bipeds are gonna do. They don't care. They've eaten their fill, they're done. So scavenging is a fantastic way to let other things do what they do and take advantage of that. That's really the human thing to do. So who's the best scavenger on the planet? Who's the best at finding dead stuff? So much so, that if you see them, you start to think, oh my God, am I about to die? You probably already know the answer. Vultures. And there they are, up in the tree. What do vultures do when they find a dead animal? <laughs> they circle in the air. So all we have to do, as homo erectines, is look up, find the vultures, walk over to where they are. They just found where the local lion kill is. And look, in the background, you see the uh, volcano? That's the volcano where we get this wonderful volcanic glass to make these Acheulean hand axes. Crazy, right? But there's more. Look at what this person, not the foreground person, but this person here, look at what he's doing. He's using an anvil stone and a hammer stone, smashing open that bone to get it what? The bone marrow. The other ones are getting the meat. He's getting bone marrow. Who else is capable of getting bone marrow? Who else is a great scavenger on the ground now in Africa? Who's the best? They're in the background, being held off by two other hominins. Hyena. Hyenas actually have a, the strongest bite of all the terrestrial animals. They can go up and get at stuff the lion can't get at. They can bite into the bone of big animals like this zebra here and get to the marrow. That's what keeps hyenas alive. So that they want at this kill, you bet. But look, all we're doing is looking like huge, big creatures because standing on our hind legs, we look really big. Wielding this stick and this rock, we can hold back a whole group of hyenas for a while. <laughs> the the vultures are easy to keep back. If we get there, they, they will stay back. They're not going to come up and attack us. 
But were these guys actually capable of hunting? Probably a little. If you look here in the background, you see these two? These two are probably doing about the effective end of our hunting. They're hunting little stuff, like rabbit, little things that won't hurt you much if you try to hunt them. It's safe to hunt. Does that make sense to everybody? So what we're looking at here in this wonderful one single picture is all of the things that these guys allowed us to do. But there's one other really crucial thing. I've talked about the Acheulean hand axe. I've talked about tool making. What is the most important tool humans ever figured out how to use? What allowed our Allen's Rule bodies to go up to places like Box Grove, England, Vimanisi, Georgia? I'm talking about the country of Georgia and Central Europe, not Georgia, the state. What allowed that to happen? The one tool that allows us to eat that meat that they're harvesting, eat that marrow that they're harvesting, fire. The biggest thing these guys did is starting to use, harness, and in some cases, maybe even create fire. We find hearths for the first time. We find these guys had cooking places where they're butchering and cooking meat, which allows them to do what? It allows them to eat and digest the meat. We're not really equipped for it otherwise. So now, this is extremely high quality food. This is higher quality than anything else hominins have been getting into yet. What does that allow? Bigger brains, and it causes us to have to pay for it with smaller, guts. Big brains, small gut, all came from the advent, the use of fire. Think about this too. What does every other animal on the planet do when they smell or see fire? Every single lion, every wildebeest, every gorilla, everything runs away from fire. So for the first time, you don't have to climb up a tree to get to safety. You don't have to live in a tree to sleep at night without getting attacked and eaten by something bigger than you. For the first time, all you have to do is create a campfire. Now you've got light, safety, heat, cooking ability. All of those things comes from one or maybe several Homo erectus, who is running away just like everybody else from a forest fire once upon a time, and he stopped. He or she, not be sexist. They stopped. They stood up, they turned around, and they said, you know what? We could use that. They might have thought originally we could use it for protection. They may have thought we could use it to cook things. They may have found things after the fire had gone through that were cooked that they then were like, wow, that smells delicious. Let's have a side of bacon, I don't know. The point is, fire changed our world. Fire opened up our world. It was the first technology that literally kept us around until today. Remember I said there were three lucky events that happened throughout our entire history? Fire is the third. 